open your Bibles with me to the book of, well, let's start in the book of Judges, chapter 11. We're going to go to an Old Testament verse. And this is one of my life verses. This is one of the verses that um, that I've built my life upon. This is one of the the landmarks of my life, sort of the halt, one of the one of the things that I, I always seem to go back to to remind me of, wh- of where I'm at and to remind me of where I'm going. And so if this is if this comes across to you as something you've heard me say a thousand times, well, then thank God, because this is going to be a thousand and one because <laughs> we all need to hear things over and over again. You didn't figure out two plus two is four the first time your teacher taught you or the first time your parent taught you. You learned you learned it through repetition and you learned how to you learned how to change your your socks by repetition. You learned how to clean your room by repetition. You learned the habits of your life by repetition. You learned how to brush your teeth by repetition. All of the habits in your life that are so essential You learn those things by doing them over and over and hearing them over and over. And many of the things when it comes to our walk with God, we're really going to grow in our lives with God when we learn things by repetition. Now, watch this. Judges chapter 11, verse one. And the reason I'm sharing this with you, because a, a couple of years ago, the Lord gave me a message for you titled becoming the best version of yourself. And so today I want to revisit that and I want to talk to you about how to become the best version of yourself, how to become the best version of yourself. Now, I have four ways to become the best version of ourselves, and I got through one of them in the earlier service. So I'm hoping to get through maybe two or three. If I can get through four, it'll be a miracle in the next 30 minutes. But it will. But and then we'll all be able to thank God that God still works miracles that I I actually got through my message and got all the points across. But but here's what he says. Because in order to be the best version of ourselves, we have to make some decisions. We have to make some choices because life is not a series. Life is not made up of the series of a series of chances. Life is not made up of luck. Life is made up of a series of choices. And it's not about what's been done to you. Life is not determined. The outcome of your life is not determined by what's been done to you. But your life is determined by how you respond. Everybody say how I respond will determine the outcome of my life. Say it again. How I respond will determine the outcome of my life. You see, many people are deceived into thinking that what what they grew up with or what's been given to them or what hasn't been given to them determines the outcome of their life. But God doesn't determine life like that. God doesn't look at life like that. He doesn't he doesn't confine you to what your life was when you were a child. He doesn't confine you to how you grew up. Maybe you were maybe you grew up in a home of alcoholism. Maybe you grew up in a home where you were abused physically or abused sexually. I hope not. But even if you were, God knows how to navigate you through and heal you where you're where you're hurting and heal you where you're broken and fix whatever is broken in your life. God knows how to do that. God knows how to take the broken pieces of our lives and put them back together. When you and I try to take the broken pieces of our lives and put them back together, they're always screwed up. I some of you heard me tell this story of when I was a kid. I don't know. I don't know how old I was, maybe seven or eight. My brother was a couple years older than me, so he was not he was uh, nine or ten. And we weren't supposed to go in the living room and play and play in our house growing up. The living room was off limits. Did anybody ever did you ever grow up in in a room where grow up in a house where there was a room you weren't supposed to go? I don't know why they call it the living room, since if you go in there, you die. (laughs) So so we're playing in this living room and we're fighting each other and pushing each other. And I can't remember what the issue was, but but we were we were really mad at each other. And and he either pushed me uh, or and he was older and he was bigger. And so, you know, he got the best of me. And and we knocked over this statue that was in our parents house. So they had this this jade statue from China. Maybe they had, I don't know if they'd been there. I don't know what where they got this from. But there was this beautiful statue uh, and it was, you know, really, uh, I guess it was expensive, valuable. I, I don't know 
how val- maybe, maybe if I found out today, it, it, I would learn that it wasn't so valuable. But to me, it was as valuable as my life, since knocking it over was, was certainly my sentence of death, as I mentioned, right? So, so we knock this thing over, and, it, and it, just, it, fall, it, it breaks into like three or four pieces. And you know what? Three or four pieces I can handle. If it's like 100 pieces, then we're sunk for sure. They're going to come home from work, and we're both dead. So what we did was we got the super glue out, the crazy glue. Remember the crazy glue where the guy, you know, is hanging from the commercial was the guy's hanging. He's, he's in a hard hat and a construction site where he's hanging from like 30 stories in the air. And they crazy glued his hard hat to a steel beam. And he's holding on to the, to the hard hat. And he's, he's standing in midair, suspended in midair because of how great crazy glue is. Does anybody remember that commercial? Now we know how old you guys are. All right. Now, now, so, the, so we, we, we decide we're going to get some crazy glue out of the drawer and we're going to glue this statue together. My, sometimes my parents watch, so this will probably be the first time they ever heard this story. <laughs> they probably still think that that thing is as valuable as it is, but it's not anymore because we broke it. Um, so, so, they, so, so this, this, we break this thing into three or four pieces and, we, and, and what it was, it was a fisherman the statue was this, this guy standing with, uh, with a fishing pole in his hand and, his, and the fish in the other hand. You know how you see things like that. So he's got the fishing pole in one hand, he's got the fish in the other hand, and he's looking so, he looks so, uh, just, he got it all together, man. He's just a picture of perfection. He's succeeded at fishing, he's handsome, he's standing straight. But when we glued him back together after breaking him, he was like this. He didn't look anything like, he didn't look any, this was, this is a compliment too, by the way. He didn't even look this good, but he didn't look anything like he started with. He didn't look anything like the original. He was not the best version of himself. After we were through with him, he was the worst version of himself. And my point in saying that is, look, if instead we would have taken the broken pieces, and so we were just hoping they wouldn't find it or they wouldn't go in there or they, or you know, they'd be drunk when they went in there and they wouldn't know what it looked like. I don't know. I was just hoping no one's going to find out. The point is, is what if I could have taken all those broken pieces instead of being so afraid that I tried to, that we tried to put them back together in such a hurry, try to put everything back together ourselves. What if we could have just taken them to our parents and said, here's the broken pieces. We're really sorry. And then they could have replaced it or they could have put it back together the right way or it wouldn't have mattered because when you when you love you don't really care uh, and you, you you can overlook and you can forgive and you can you can you can wa- you can wash over the mistakes that your loved ones make when you really love somebody right but we didn't know that and we didn't we didn't think that way and so we tried to fix it ourselves and that's the picture of so many of our lives we try to bring God a fixed life rather than just bringing him the broken pieces. We try to put all the broken pieces back together ourselves and, it's, and, and it looks worse than how we started and it's all, and we're like this when we're supposed to be like this. And God hasn't created us to fix our lives He's created us to simply bring the broken pieces of our lives to him and he knows how to fix our lives and he knows how to get us where we're supposed to go and he knows how to turn us into the people and make us into the people that we're supposed to be. Amen? So I hope that makes sense and, uh, and you, you can draw any conclusions that you want to draw from that. But that's why I bring you to this verse because every one of us has to make a choice of which version of ourselves we're going to be, the best version of ourselves or the worst version of ourselves. And that's why there's a dichotomy. There's a there's a distinction in verse one of Judges chapter 11, verse one. Notice what he says. Now, Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, but everybody say but but he was the son of a harlot or that word means he was the son of a prostitute. He was a mighty man of valor, but 
He was the son of a prostitute. Now, why is there this distinction between these two versions of this man? It's because this is a picture of every one of our lives. Every one of us has to make up our mind which version of ourselves we're going to be. Are we, now, notice what he says. Jephthah was a mighty man of valor. That's God's version of him. But he was, a, he was the son of a harlot or the son of a prostitute. That's, 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 his, that's the worldly version of him. That's his natural version. That's how he grew up. That's what his characteristics were. He, like if you grew up in an alcoholic home or if you grew up where you were abused, if you grew up in a, in a home where you, weren't, you, you didn't have your needs met, if you grew up in a home where it was broken. I, and I think, frankly, we all have some of this that we grew up with. We all have a, a, a two versions of our, a split version of ourselves. And that's why we have to make a choice. Am I going to side with God's version of me, a mighty man of valor? This is my destiny, a mighty man of valor. Or am I going to side with my history? This is how I grew up. This is what I was taught. This is what I learned. This is how I was screwed up growing up in my life. And this screwed me up and this screwed me up. And everybody can say something screwed you up growing up, whether it was your parents, whether it was a teacher, whether it was a girlfriend or a boyfriend, whether it was a mistake you made, whether it was something you did. Every one of us can testify to how we, we screwed up or, we, we got, or something was screwed up in our lives at one time or another. And we have to make up our mind which version of ourselves we're going to be. And I think God gives us this beautiful picture of a man with two versions. God's version, the version of his destiny, and man's version, the version of his history. And if you choose today, if you, and, and let me put it to you this way, not making a choice is a choice Amen. to become your history's version of yourself. Not making a choice is actually a choice that I'm just going to flow with whatever DNA I grew up with, whatever DNA I started with. Because look, when Adam and Eve sinned, we've got to stop blaming our parents for stuff, by the way, because we all come from the same parents, Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they spun into motion the, the DNA of brokenness, the DNA of sin. And when, and when they spun it in, they didn't do it deliberately. They just, it was the result of sin. And when they did it, it's like some people caught the DNA of smoking addictions and some people caught the DNA of sexual addictions and some people caught the DNA of alcohol addictions. Some people caught the DNA of anger addiction. I know, I know some of us who deal with anger more heavily than others, we, 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 we sometimes don't categorize it in the same way. We think, oh, well, you know, anger's not as bad as this or this isn't bad as that. And what we have to realize is we're all, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and we all need to be born again. And so whatever was spun into your, into your DNA is the DNA of your history, but God wants to spin his new DNA into you, the DNA of your destiny. And the way that it works is by decision. Decision is the doorway into reality. We've got to stop fantasizing about what we can become one day and start making the decisions that will bring us there. We got to make decisions. We got to make choices. And, and so, look, why is there this contradiction between what God says we are and what we sometimes experience in this life? You can choose to be and believe who God says you are, or you can choose to be the byproduct of what this life has done to you, your choices and your past. It's up to you. Why is there a contradiction between what God says we are, mighty man of valor, and what our past says we are? But you're the son of a harlot. You're this, you're that. You're the son of an alcoholic. You're the son, you're the daughter of a, a, this guy or that, that bad. But, we're, but remember, we're born again, and so now we're sons and daughters of God. And so we have, to, we have to make a decision to deliberately identify with who we are in Christ. It's a decision. It's a decision. And, you know, I love this word but in the Bible because but is an interruption. The word but represents an interruption. And 
you see God has a plan for your life, but the devil wants to interrupt God's plan by reminding you of your past and by confining you and defining you by your past. You see, you have no idea what's on the other side of the, of the, if you'll make the decisions I'm about to give you, if you'll make these decisions, you have no idea what's on the other side of these things. When you make these decisions, it will be a doorway into living a reality that you've never lived before because you can't live in a reality you don't choose. You can only live in the reality that you choose. You can only live a life based on the choices that you make or you can be a victim the rest of your life. But we're gonna make some choices today. And when you make these choices, I got good news for you. On the other side of these decisions is a better life than you could have ever imagined. But the fear that the devil will try to put on you is the, the fear of making these decisions or the fear that deciding these things will somehow hurt you. No, deciding these things will help you. Deciding not to decide will hurt you. Does everybody see these two pictures of Jephthah? It's a picture of how there's two pictures of each of us. There's destiny's version, that's God's version, and then there's history's version. That's Satan's version of defining you so he can confine you. The enemy confines you by how he defines you. And if you let your past define you, then you will let your past confine you. And that's why we have to make our decisions in accordance with God's word. Now, you remember how the Bible says, the thief, John chapter 10, verse 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you would have life in abundance till it overflows, right? You see, he uses the word but to interrupt Satan's plan. Satan's plan is to steal, kill, and destroy, but... God interrupts that with his plan that you would have life in abundance till it overflows. So here, God's plan is that you be a mighty man of valor. By the way, back in, Jep uh, back in Judges 11.1, 1, Jephthah hasn't even been in a, in a battle yet. Jephthah hasn't even played cards yet. Jephthah hasn't even played battleship yet. Jephthah hasn't even, he hasn't even had a fight yet. And yet God calls him a mighty man of valor because God always calls us something before it looks like we are that thing. He calls us great before greatness shows up. He calls us healed before healing shows up. He calls us blessed before blessing shows up. He calls us redeemed before redemption shows up. He calls us the things he calls us before those things show up because God sees the future and God sees your destiny and God sees his dream for your life and God called you before you were ever born, before you were ever designed. Now, look, I don't know how you got here. Think about it. Well, you know, we, we talk about, like, when you talk about sex in church, it's sometimes it's, you know, people get nervous. I don't know why. And it gets, gets real quiet <laughs> in church. Talk about sex. But in my view, almost all of us got here because of sex. <laughs> Some of you will get that later, almost. <laughs> Because I don't know, there may be some aliens here. You might have come from another planet. But most of us got here because some people had sex, and now you're here. Now, I know, that's, I know that may come by way of shock and surprise to, to many of us, but that's how you got here. And to God, listen, God does not measure your destiny based on the portal that you came through. You might have come through two parents that weren't even married and, all, and, and, they were just, and they were just doing what Marvin Gaye said. They were just getting it on. <laughs> In the back seat of a Chevy. I don't know how you got here. But no matter how you got, no matter what portal you came through, no matter what caused your parents to come together for you to be born is irrelevant to God. God used whatever doorway that you came into this earth so that he could begin to fulfill his destiny for your life. Now, you, on the other hand, you might have got here because two parents, they were like in awe of each other and, and they, were, they were serving God and loving God and they just wanted to bring, fill the earth with good things. And I 
Most of us didn't get here like that, frankly. <laughs> we got here because two people wanted to have sex, whether they were married or they weren't married. I don't know what portal you came through, but God doesn't care. Because his purpose was to, was to see you born so that he could begin to fulfill his destiny for your life. And you come through this perfect parents kind of concept, Christian parents that love God and did everything right. That doesn't make you more significant. And if you came from the back seat of a Chevy, that doesn't make you less significant. When you're born, you are made for the glory of God. And you are made with a destiny and a purpose that is beyond your wildest dreams. And that's why you've got to make these choices. That's why these choices will bring you into that destiny. What's going to distinguish between if you're going to be a mighty man of valor, your destiny, or the son of a harlot, or the son of... You know, the, the son of a, you know what, or the son of. <sighs> some of us, now don't take this wrong. Some of us had the misfortune. Don't take this wrong. This is tongue in cheek. It's not a, it's, it's not gospel truth, but there's a point that I want to make in saying what I'm about to say. Are you ready? Some of us had the misfortune of being raised really well. Now, it's better to be raised well than not be raised well. Everybody knows I believe that, right? Come on, help me. You know, don't walk out of here and go, ah, the pastor said, it's, uh, man, you better not to be raised. It's a misfortune. It's wrong. It's bad if you were raised well. I'm not saying that. But some of us do have the misfortune of being raised well. And the, what I mean by that is sometimes if we're raised really well, that becomes the ceiling over our lives and we never become more than how we were raised because we're not awakened to the problems that we have and we're not awakened to a greater purpose and a greater desire and a greater dream to really count in life and to really matter in life and to really be significant in life so we just become like our parents. And listen, if you, if you, if you care about your parents and if you think your parents care about you, you, you need to know something. They don't want you to become what they were. They want you to go way past where they were, way past where they are. They want you to grow way. They want you to grow way beyond. See, even though, even though to some degree my kids were raised pretty good, mostly because of their mother, but my, my kids were raised pretty good, that's, that cannot be a ceiling for them. That can be a curse if they allow that to be their ceiling. Like, I, want the, I just want to be the shoulders that they stand on so they can go higher and they can go further so they can forget what's behind and press forward to what lies ahead. And the Bible says in Philippians, the Bible says in Philippians 3.13 that, that they can reach towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's an upward call reaching forward to that upward call in verse 14. It, that call has taken us up higher and higher. God is calling us higher and higher and higher, and we've got to be, we've got to make the decisions that bring us there. And what are those decisions? Decision number one, decide today what kind of worshiper you're going to be. Now, every person is a worshiper. Christian or not Christian, everybody's worshiping something. Everybody is worshiping something. Everybody is worshiping something. And what does it mean to worship? It means to present yourself to something. It means to surrender yourself to something. Some people worship money. They surrender themselves to just, it's all about money. Other people surrender themselves to affection and attention. It's all about having attention. We have to make up our minds what kind of worshiper we're going to be. Now, when it comes to Christians, there's two kinds of worshipers. When it comes to being a Christian, we either, be, we either become a worshiper that just, we see worship as a song. That we just sing and we think that's worship. Singing is not worship. Singing can be an expression of our worship, but worship is not singing. Let me show you what worship is. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Watch this. Now, this is decision number one. Decide what kind of worshiper you're going to be. If you will make up your mind, here, this is the kind of worshiper I'm going to be. What I'm about to define for you is the kind of worshiper you should choose to be today. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, notice what he says worship is here in verse 1. He says worship is presenting your bodies to God as a living and holy sacrifice. Now, we know of people in history who have died for their faith, and they are heroes, and they are warriors, and they are, they are to be feared and revered and loved and honored and respected. But to die for your faith happens in a moment. God wants us to live for our faith. He says, worship is to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. We're not supposed to die and then worship God. We're supposed to worship God by presenting ourselves alive to him. Here I am, Lord. Here's my body. Everything in it is yours. Everything on it is yours. Everything that comes from it is yours. My ideas are yours. My dreams are yours. All that's screwed up in my life, it's yours too. I'm presenting myself to you in all of my lack of glory, in all of my, in, 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 in all of my, um, my, my mess. I'm giving it all to you. Whatever this body contains, the good, the bad, and the ugly, my soul, my heart, my dreams, my desires, my money, my career, my future, my past, my present, I present all of it to God, and I say, Lord, here, do something with this. That's worship. That's worship. It's presenting yourself to God and saying, here, God, do something with me. And to think that he can't, to think that you got to fix everything and then bring him a perfect life, that's not worship. That's religion. That's fake. It's false. Nobody brings to God a perfect life. Nobody brings to God a life that has it all together. We all bring to God a life that's got some mess in it. We all bring to God some conflict. We all bring to God, we all have conflict in us. We all have two opinions of ourselves. We all have two versions of ourselves. In many ways, you know, we're all, we all feel a little schizophrenic sometimes, don't we? I know, I've, I feel a little schizophrenic sometimes, and so do I. And <laughs> I know, I'm pulling out all the oldies. But this is worship. It's presenting myself to God with all my flaws, with all my mistakes, with all my heartaches, with all my pain, with all my trouble, with all my dreams, with all my desires, with all the good things and my gifts and talents, my abilities and my disabilities, my talents and my lack of talent. My, my, my humor and my stupidity, my, my, my wisdom and my foolish, I'm presenting it all to God, and I'm not saying that I'm going to stay that way. If I want to stay that way, I should keep myself to myself. But if I present myself to him, he's going to change me. And he's going to make me the best version of myself. This is decision number one. It's the doorway into reality. What kind of worshiper are you going to be? And then the second thing he says about worship is found in the next verse. Notice what he says. So worship is presenting our bodies to him. And then verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you, may that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Notice what he says. This is worship. He's talking about worship in verse 1 and 2. And he says, this is, this is true spiritual worship. It's not just singing a song. Our songs should be the overflow of our surrender, not the substitute for our surrender. Are you hearing me? You guys, listen. Our songs should be the overflow of our, of our surrender, not a substitute for our surrender. Just because we sing, we shouldn't say, oh, I sang to you, Lord, I lifted my hands, now I'm going to go do my own thing. Then now what we've done is we've made our songs and our singing a substitute for what real worship should be. Real worship is to present our bodies as a living sacrifice and present our minds. Amen. So true worship is, is to agree with God's way of thinking. To, true worship is to renew your mind and let God transform you. So I'm presenting my body as a living sacrifice and I'm presenting my mind to God to let his word transform the way I think because as I change the way I think, 
my life will change as I agree with God. Worship is to agree with God. It's so to say I'm worshiping God, but then to 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 not surrender my thought life to him. I'm not really worshiping. I'm worshiping him when I present my body to him and I surrender my thought life to him. You still with me? Amen. So that's true worship. So so decide what kind of worshiper you're going to be. Abraham went. God told him, give me your son, your only son in Genesis 22. And Abraham went to the mountain where God told him and he told his guys, stay here until me and my son, we're going to go up to the mountain, we're going to worship and then we're going to come back down from the mountain. In other words, he called his the sacrifice of his son. He called it worship. He called it worship. So when are we really worshiping God? When we hold nothing back from God. Decision, decision number one, what kind of worshiper are you going to be? What kind of worshiper are you going to be? Are you going to be a worshiper who just worships in word only or you present your body, surrender your thought life and hold nothing back from God? Now we're worshiping when somebody. You know, the, the picture of somebody. Pulling up to a bank and sticking out a gun and saying. Put your hands up. What does that mean? It means I surrender and I'm not holding anything back and there's the money. And here's the here's the uh, the combination to the safe. I surrender. See, worship is not just it's, it's not just lifting our hands, but it's why we lift our hands. I surrender. I surrender. You have your idea of how your life is supposed to be. God has his idea of how your life is supposed to be. Choose to surrender to his version of what your life is supposed to be. Decide what kind of worshiper you're going to be. Amen. Decide what kind of worshiper you're going to be. Number two, decide. What kind of mentality are you going to have in life? What kind of mentality are you going to have in life? A victim mentality. I'm too small. I'm too poor. I'm too black, too white, too Hispanic, too this. I'm a woman. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too this. I'm too that. Born on the wrong side of the tracks. I watched a, a, a little documentary the other day about one of these great, one of the great NFL players of all time. His name was Christian Okoye. He was a Christian from Nigeria. He's the first Nigerian to ever play in the NFL. And ever since then, it's been like a ton of Nigerian men that have played in the NFL and played professional sports and, you know, had an impact. But the, the point being is that he grew up with a mentality of you, you, you can't go to America. You can't you can't make a difference. You can't make an impact. You can't um, you, you, you could never rise beyond whatever this country would afford you. And yet he decided I'm not going to be a byproduct of the country I was born in. I'm going to be a byproduct of the gifts God has placed inside of me and I'm going to become the best version of myself. I'm not going to have a victim mentality. I'm going to have a victor mentality. And each one of us has to choose what kind of mentality we're going to have in our lives, a victim mentality or a victor mentality. And I want to uh, close with a story because I'm out of time. So I just want to remind you of the story of I've told you this before, but the German shepherd who was pregnant with puppies. One day she was hit by a car and both of her back legs were broken. She was able to drag herself back to her home. Her owner never took her to the vet, unfortunately. But as the weeks went by, it looked like she slowly recovered. But because her legs were not properly reset, she dragged her back legs when she walked. Now, since she was pregnant already, she finally had her puppies and they seemed to be healthy and whole. But a few weeks later, when the puppies started walking, they dragged their back legs just like their mother. The owner was shocked. He thought maybe they had been injured in the accident since the mother was pregnant when when she had this accident. He took them to the vet to have them checked out. The doctor discovered there was nothing wrong with the puppies. They were perfectly healthy. Those puppies were simply copying their mother. They walked that way because it was all that they had seen modeled in front of them. That's the way they were supposed to walk in their minds. That's all they knew. And that's what happens to us as well. 
We're only going to become what we see modeled in front of us. And if we grew up with bad modeling, and most of us did in, to some degree, and God bless all of our parents and grandparents, but we all, and we all grew up with a mixture of good modeling and bad modeling, but we have to change the images of any of the bad modeling that was in front of us. And we have to find the stories in the Bible of men and women who went forward with God against all odds. Moses was a stutterer. David committed murder. Uh, Elijah was depressed and ran from Jezebel. Uh, Rahab was a harlot. You go through the Bible and you see these men and women who were in the natural restricted and confined by their limitations, and yet somehow, some way, God raised them up because they were unwilling to be limited by how they grew up. And, and it leads me to say this, this, this last thought, is that to be the best version of yourself, you have to decide what kind of worshiper are you going to be, you have to decide what kind of mentality are you going to have, and you have to decide what kind of associations you're going to surround yourself with. What kind of people are you going to surround yourself? Choose the right associations. Eagles don't fly with buzzards. If you lay down with dogs, you're going to get fleas. Choose to run with champions, and you will become one. Amen.